Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for Introduction to Psychology. In this one we will be looking at abnormal psychology. So we're going to start with it, we're going to look at assessment, we're going to look at some psychological disorders, then in the next lecture we'll look at some more specific to, to some, uh, some subfields of abnormal psychology and then we'll finish with treatment. So in this set of slides, we're going to start by talking about abnormal psychology, defining it, looking at the things that go into it. Uh, we'll look at causes of abnormal behavior, or at least some of them. And then we'll talk about how most abnormal behavior is assessed. We'll then look at the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual, for diagnosing uh, psychological disorders. And then we'll actually get into some of the disorders. We'll talk about anxiety disorders, mood disorders, conversion disorders, the dissociative disorders, those are fun, the personality dis disorders, those are very interesting, finally schizophrenia, everyone's favorite topic. And then in, that's basically what we will look at going in through this chapter. Before we get into it though, we have to make a distinction. This distinction is that there is a difference between insanity and mental disorders or abnormal psychology. Abnormal psychology is technically the study of disordered behavior. So you have uh, that as a difference from mental disorders, but now let's look at the difference between mental disorders themselves and insanity. Insanity is a term that's been used for a long time. Early on, it was within the classification of mental disorders. However, it is now not. There is no such thing as insanity within abnormal psychology. Insanity is 100% a legal definition. It is a legal definition within the courts, within the, the legal systems in, in countries and states that basically means not knowing the difference between right and wrong. Insanity itself has nothing directly to do with abnormal psychology or mental disorders. Instead, there is the, the argument that some mental disorders lead to this type of insanity where the person doesn't know the difference between right and wrong. But a big difference again there, insanity is just knowing the difference between right and wrong, whereas mental disorders are prolonged or recurring problems that interfere with an individual's ability to live or satisfying a person's personal life, um, to be a functional member of society, these types of things. So when we're talking about mental disorders, we're talking about the things that adversely affect someone's life or their functioning. Again, big difference there between that and insanity. So insanity is not a psychological term or definition. Insanity is a legal term. Mental disorders are the psychological terms. When we're looking at abnormal behavior and abnormal psychology, we need to look at, well, what is, what was, what is classified as normal and abnormal? So if we are, we're looking at mental disorders as abnormal behavior, what is our definition of abnormal? And this is where we've got actually three approaches to defining abnormal behavior. The first approach is the statistical frequency approach. And this is basically says that a behavior is abnormal if it occurs rarely or infrequently in relations to the behaviors in the general population. So it's something that is rare or infrequent. Now that doesn't do that well to define what we would consider as a mental disorder because there are some people who have these behaviors that are infrequent in a population that really there's no issue, there's no problem. So we, we have to add on two more stipulations. The next is deviation from social norms. That is the behaviors are abnormal if it deviates greatly from societal standards, values, or norms. And this is where now, okay, you have something that's infrequent that's also deviating from what is expected of an individual in society. And then finally, 
the the final stipulation is maladaptive that means a behavior is abnormal if it's psychologically damaging if it interferes with an individual's ability to function in, in their life in society or if it interferes with others ability to function so on the slide here it doesn't really say as much about others but when we're talking about maladaptive we're not just talking about harm to the self or a deficiency in one's ability to function in society but also the possibility of making it so others have difficulty functioning in society so hindering others so when we look at abnormal behavior this is basically the the three types of things we're, we're going to look at we're going to look at something that's um, statistically infrequent and or is deviant from the social norms and or is maladaptive to the individual or others and basically it typically has to have two of the three of these and the statistical frequency the statistical frequency approach it can't be by itself um, the deviation from social norms can't really be by itself uh, unless it's causing harm and the the bottom one the maladaptive that one if it's by itself typically is okay but usually you need two or even all three of these to be present for it to be counted as abnormal next let's get into the causes I'm just going to be brief on this because these are things we've talked about throughout the semester so it's not like it's going to be that big of a reveal that abnormal behavior is caused in very similar ways to a lot of normal behavior so there's genetic factors there's genetic factors that contribute to the development of disorders um, the inherited tendencies and this is where we talked about the diathesis stress model early in the semester and how you have a genetic predisposition a basically a set point due to your genetics coming into the the basically coming into the world and some people have more some people have less it doesn't mean you're going to develop a psychological disorder or not it just means you're more some people are more susceptible to developing specific psychological disorders the next is neurological so this is again back to biological but it's not necessarily genetics it could be something to do with um, things like life history theory that I talked about earlier in the semester where early life events affect later life outcomes well this could have been one of the things so a, it could have been a stressful early life that leads to more susceptibility to developing a disorder so the first half is the biological factors we are going to get in just a second to these others but you see on the right you see that it's a mix of the social psychological and biological factors and looking at those it just looking at the other things that can come in um, the cognitive emotional behavioral and environmental factors so this is the de deficits in cognitive process um, having unusual thoughts or beliefs that usually come from environmental effects deficit in processing emotional stimuli overacting to emotional stimulus situations and this can again be a biological predisposition or an environmentally learned thing um, lacking social skills other environmental challenges like stressful situations all of these combine together with those biological to result in abnormal behavior just like they can result in normal behavior so let's switch to assessing mental disorders so when we talk about assessing mental disorders what we're looking at here is science so assessing mental disorders is done through science it's there's been research into how to diagnose the various different disorders um, and when a clinician a clinical psychologist a counseling psychologist uh, a psychiatrist um, any of those when they are trying to diagnose someone 
just like when a doctor is trying to diagnose a physical ailment and they have a set of procedures that they go through based on science to diagnose it, psychology does the same thing. Assessing mental disorders is the same thing. There is a, a systematic evaluation of the person's physiological, biological, social factors, identifying past and present problems, stressors, and other cognitive behavioral symptoms. And there are, when we're talking about physical health, so when we're talking about doctors, they, they tend to be able to diagnose things, but sometimes they can't. Sometimes it's just not, they, they being able to get to a solution isn't the easiest thing in the world. Uh, psychology is like that, but even worse, in that it, there are some times where it's really easy to identify a cause of an abnorm, abnormality, a cause of a mental disorder. There's some times where it's really easy to diagnose a mental disorder. There's other times where it is much more difficult, and there are times where when we're looking at causes of mental disorders that we, we can't even find or pinpoint a specific cause. So it is similar to medical doctors, but slightly different in that there is less certainty, let's say. And we've talked about before, but psychiatrists are medical doctors and they go through these procedures just like they would if they were diagnosing a physical ailment. One of the main ways to assess uh, mental disorders is through a series of tests. So the first is where neurological tests are done. This is where you check for possible brain damage or malfunction. So if you identify a disorder, if you can identify a physical cause such as brain damage or a physical cause such as a deficit in some part of the brain, that is the, the easy way to solve the problem. That is, but that should be basically one of the, the first steps if a person is actually has a disorder. The second is the clinical interview. The clinical interview is something that, that therapists do, and this is where it's gonna be a psychologist, psychiatrist, clinical counseling, whatever it is, doing a clinical interview. So you gather information about a person's past, current behaviors, their beliefs, their attitudes, their emotions, their problems, and this can be one of three ways you do this. You can do it as unstructured, which is basically free form. You, you just talk back and forth with them. It's fully structured, which is where you've got specific questions you ask them. You ask them a question, get a response, ask the next question, let's get a response. And then the most common, the one that's mostly used is semi-structured. Semi-structured is you have a overview or a, a basically an outline of the topics to talk about. But if the, the client, patient and client interchangeable here, um, psychologists prefer to call people clients rather than patients. If the client um, says something that that makes the clinician think that, that it might be in one direction, the clinician has the freedom in a semi-structured interview to go in that direction rather than just now asking the next question in the list. And that's what's the most common. And then finally, it is psychological tests. Uh, the, the most common are objective tests where you do questionnaires, self-report, maybe even it's done in an interview form where they clinician will ask questions and you respond and your responses are on the psychological test or projective tests as well but as we talked about earlier in the semester projective tests don't have much validity they're typically used more as an icebreaker the clinician uses them as an icebreaker rather than an actual assessing technique now that we've briefly talked about um, the, the way disorders are assessed. And I should be saying this, if you take abnormal psychology, I just spent two slides on something that there would be an entire lecture on. Uh, so that's one of those things, abnormal psychology is going to go into this in much more detail. 
I've got basically one week, three lectures to cover an entire semester that you'd cover in abnormal psychology. Fortunately, some of the things we covered earlier in the semester get us to this point, but at the same time, I'm not spending that much time on these things or going into that much detail. Let's next talk about the, along with how we, we diagnose disorders, how we assess and diagnose disorders, is the DSM. Um, and the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistics Manual of Mental Disorders, and it basically dis describes a system for assessing specific symptoms and matching them to different mental disorders. And this is done through a clinical process where you essentially match an individual's symptoms to those that define a specific disorder. And again, if we were spending more time in here, I'd talk about the, the ICD, which is the International Classification of Disorders or Diseases, Diseases and Disorders. Um, the ICD is actually, see, the DSM is used in the US, and the DSM just explains mental disorders. The ICD explains physical and mental disorders and is used internationally. Most countries of the world use the ICD. Um, the U.S. uses the DSM. Uh, China has their own um, diagnostic manual for mental disorders. So it, it depends on where you are. The, the thing is, though, is the DSM and the ICD tend to have quite a bit of overlap. They're, they're in some ways, the mental part, mental disorder parts of the ICD are done by the same people who make the DSM. So the new ICD is coming out soon and it's going to match up with the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is, is different than the ICD-10 that's currently out because it, the DSM-5 is newer. And then the, the ICD-11 will come out and it'll match the DSM-5. And I'm not going to spend too much time on explaining how um, a lot has changed, but I do want to point out that the DSM-5 is relatively new. It's only about six, seven years old. Uh, your book doesn't even talk about it because it's newer than your book. Uh, your book says coming soon in the DSM-5 and they still got stuff wrong. Uh, a, some big changes though with the DSM-5 is, is how disorders are categorized and how they're labeled and a lot of disorders that you used to be common or used to be diagnosed are no longer there and they're now put into more of a spectrum format. That being said, there's still some problems with the DSM even now, even with uh, getting to the DSM-5. Uh, a lot of psychologists think they haven't gotten far enough yet and I think it was more of they, they are going for more gradual changes so people don't freak out about the big changes. And as you see revisions to the DSM-5, you'll, you'll see them getting more towards this. But one issue that we still have is labeling mental disorders. Uh, when you, you basically label a disorder, you're labeling an individual who has it. And we talked about this a bit earlier in the semester when I talked about autism, and I'll talk about it again today, but uh, when I talked about autism and what's in a label. And essentially by labeling disorders, you're labeling individuals, you're putting individuals into categories. And there are positives that can come from this, like the, the knowing what help needs to be done, knowing how to get people together with other people who maybe are suffering from the same thing and they can help each other. But there are also definitely negative associations that come from this as well. And there, when we're just talking about this, there's still things like anxious, compulsive, mentally ill, and it can change how other people perceive the in individual. Other unresolved issues with the DSM, one is the problem of comorbidity. So comorbidity is defined as having two or more disorders at the same time in the same person. Comorbidity is a, a big issue in psychology because most disorders that are out there have high comorbidity. It's extremely common. However, uh, the, the DSM still doesn't look at disorders together. It looks at each disorder individually. So even though high comorbidity is a problem, 
looking at how individuals who maybe have both anxiety and depression, having those classified differently than an individual that just has anxiety or an individual that just has depression is, is an issue that, that still needs to be addressed. So reliability may be at the expense of validity. And finally, what's, what's an issue is dimensional classification. So the DSM-5 um, is intended to move toward, more towards a dimensional approach. Uh, this is something I didn't talk about before, so I'll talk about very briefly. But when we're talking about abnormal behavior, um, one of the issues is, is do we have specific categories that are, are separate, or do we have uh, basically dimensions or spectrums? And the DSM-5 is has been shifting more towards the spectrums, the dimensional classification rather than just categories. And that's because that's what a lot of clinicians have found. When we talk about schizophrenia, uh, I'll point out how there's personality disorders that have high correlation with schizophrenia, but they are not counted as schizophrenia. And there's, there's actually genetic components that have been found a link between them. The, the argument is, is that we shouldn't have these personality disorders and schizophrenia separate. We should have a broader spectrum of schizophrenia that includes these personality disorders. And the DSM-5 has moved in that direction, but many believe that it doesn't, didn't move far enough. And again, this is, I think, just a case of them moving in a gradual way, and eventually we'll get to that point where, where it is that way with more revisions. So in this chapter, in this set of slides, we're going to have three sets of slides, as I said. We're going to look at a bunch of different mental disorders. Uh, we're not actually going to look at all of these. We'll look at them very briefly. I'm not going to look at like the organic and the substance-related disorders, but these are our main classifications of disorders. Most disorders fall under one of these headings. There are some disorders that go beyond them. Um, you don't, yeah, the, the, the sleep disorders you don't see here, stuff like that. Um, the eating disorders. Uh, but those, again, most of the disorders are going to fall within these different disorders, this list. So you've got the developmental disorders. These are disorders that are typically first diagnosed in, in infancy, childhood, or in early adolescence. We'll talk about some of those briefly, but this is things like ADHD, uh, autism, things like that. You have the organic mental disorders. These are the ones that are more biologically related. Uh, some of these are, are, you can look at some of the ones like uh, Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and things like that. You've got the substance related and um, impulse control disorders. So it just says substance related here, but what's been found is impulse control disorders are highly correlated here. So they've been brought, they've been put into the same category. So substance related where you've got an addiction, but that includes things like gambling addiction. So in, it gets included in there. Uh, schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders. We'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, mood disorders. These are going to be disorders of mood uh, where you've got both in both directions depression and mania you've got the anxiety disorders the disorders that are related to anxiety the somatoform disorders they're they're not really called the somatoform disorders anymore but it is a a group of disorders that in the dsm-5 has a slightly different name but we'll talk about those a little bit um, the dissociative disorders where you've got basically a detachment from reality. Um, sexual and gender identity disorders. We're not going to talk about those, but I will say real quick here, um, going back to, there is one thing that when it comes to classifications of disorders I talked about earlier, but really has to come to the front here. And that is for it to be classified as a disorder, it has to be something that is an impairment to functioning. It's either a, a harmful to the self, harmful to others, impairs functioning, that type of thing. So 
when we say gender identity disorders, that doesn't mean that an individual who is biologically male who identifies as female has a disorder. What that means is if an individual who is biologically male has feelings of being female and that is causing them significant distress, then we would classify it as a disorder because it has that distress component. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to go into the gender identity disorders or sexual dis sexuality disorders. Um, that's a whole long topic to talk about. Uh, abnormal psychology is a very good class to take for that. And then finally, the personality disorders. Um, there are 10 personality disorders, and we will look at each of those. There's two other terms in relation to abnormal psychology that are, are relevant and important before we actually get into the disorders, and that is these two terms are is incidence and prevalence. So incidence, and I'm not going to talk about these for each of the disorders, but it, it's good to understand that these are things that, that are looked at in a research context. So incidence is the number of new cases within a given period of time. So the number of new cases of a disorder within a given period of time. That given period of time can be a day, week, month, year, or it can be um, over the lifetime. So it can be a lifetime incidence. Prevalence is the number of people with a given disorder at a specific moment in time. So a good example is if we looked at like lifetime incidence of depression. And what you find is about 30 to 40 percent of people have, um, or as you see here, 28 percent of people will have a mood disorder in their lifetime. However, if you looked at prevalence, which is the amount of people at any given moment in time, it's going to be much lower, 5 to 10 percent, somewhere in that range. Meaning that Prevalence is just looking at who has it at the specific moment in time. Incidence is the number of people who develop that disorder throughout over a given period of time. And again, that's going to typically be lifespan, but you might look at incidence of people who get a disorder in their 20s, incidence of people who get, um, when we look at um, coronavirus, the incident incidence is the number of new cases that have been have come about whereas the prevalence is the number of people who have it at that exact moment in time okay let's get into the uh, disorders we're going to start with the anxiety disorders and we're going to start first with generalized anxiety disorders so we're going to talk about a bunch of different anxiety disorders we'll start with generalized anxiety disorder. So generalized anxiety disorder is where an individual has excessive or unre unrealistic worry about almost everything. They have this constant feeling that something bad is about to happen. Um, another thing with generalized anxiety disorder is uh, another term for it is an individual who goes from crisis to crisis, meaning they have anxiety about one thing, like maybe anxiety about driving into school. So they, they have this anxiety that they're going to get in an accident. Then they get to school. They didn't get in an accident. Well, now they've got to walk to class and they have anxiety about bumping into someone or talking to someone or doing something embarrassing or possibly even like getting attacked. They, they make it to class fine. So now they have anxi anxiety about class, anxiety that they'll be called on in class, anxiety that they, they might not understand what's going on. They make it through class just fine. Now they've got anxiety walking back to their car, anxiety driving home. So generalized anxiety disorder is just basically going from one crisis to another. Um, symptoms include uh, restlessness, fatigue, sweating, pounding heart, insomnia is common, headaches, muscle tension, irritability, difficulty concentrating. Um, and it all comes back to un unable to control your worry that is out of proportion to the actual event. Yes, having a little bit of anxiety is normal for driving. Having so much anxiety that you're gripping the wheel white knuckled the entire time, like it's a ice storm when it's not, that is anxiety worry that is out of proportion to the actual event. 
How is this treated? It's typically treated with um, psychotherapy, sometimes with drugs, typically without. Um, Anti-anxiety meds are, are commonly prescribed, but the efficacy of them is, is questionable because therapy, especially things like CBT therapy, which we'll, we've talked about before, but it's cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT therapy is, is, has the, the best outcomes. Uh, so in this disorder, you kind of see how I'm going to explain a lot of these disorders. Not all of them are going to be this, but basically I'm going to say the disorder, describe it, talk about the symptoms, and talk about treatment. And since there's a lot of disorders and we don't have a lot of time, I'm just basically going to go over each of the major ones briefly. The next disorder we'll talk about is panic disorder kind of talked about this before when we talked about the difference between anxiety, panic, and worry, and talked about panic attacks. Well, what is panic disorder? Panic disorder is um, characterized by recurrent and unexpected panic attacks, or when an individual is so worried about having a panic attack that it, it that worry interferes with their normal day-to-day -day functioning. So somebody with panic disorder doesn't necessarily have to have had more than one or two panic attacks. Doesn't have to continue to have panic attacks. It is more of um, where someone's worry about having a panic attack affects their life. So they might not leave the house because or drive because they're so worried about having a panic attack. Symptoms of this, we already talked about what a panic attack is. Panic, a period of intense fear. Um, for more of this list of symptoms, so that's the, the, the symptoms of a panic attack. The symptoms of a panic disorder are going to then include intense worry about having a panic attack. And what's the treatment for this? Uh, I am a big proponent of therapy. I am, except when needed, I'm an opponent of drugs. But typically for panic disorder, drugs are prescribed, antidepressants, benzos. Um, but therapy, again, going back to cognitive behavioral therapy, actually has been shown to have a lot of efficacy in reducing panic disorder. Getting the person to cognitively realize that they're not going to have a panic attack. And even if they did have a panic attack, it's not going to be, it's not going to kill them. It's not going to cause them to get in a car accident, that type of thing. So it's getting them to realize that will reduce the, the anxiety that their panic disorder is, is presenting. The next anxiety disorder we're going to talk about is phobia. And we're going to talk about a couple different phobias um, or different types of phobias. But what is a, a phobia? It's an anxiety disorder characterized by intense and irrational fear. It basically, intense fear is the most important thing. Irrational is an important component, but it's not the just the only component. Having a fear of heights is, is rational. Having an intense fear of heights when there's no chance of you falling is irrational. And it's out of proportion to the possible danger of the object or situation. So a phobia is where you have intense and irrational fear to a object or situation that is out of proportion. It comes, it's accompanied by increased physical arousal. Um, the person will go to great lengths to avoid the feared event. And if it cannot be avoided, the person feels intense anxiety about it. And again, this is completely irrational in, in how these work. Uh, I saw a video once of a, a guy, he was a, a big guy, he was a farmer, and he had an intense, uncontrollable fear of cats. Even seeing a picture of a cat caused him to start sweating and start panicking. So it just goes to show that it's, it's irrational. And it turns out he was attacked by a cat as a kid, so it made sense that, that his body, why his body started to have that phobia. But at the same time, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't rational for him to have that level of fear to just a picture of a cat. 
Uh, when we're talking about phobias, though, we have to look at a, a few different phobias. So one that is separate from the rest. So separate from the rest is social phobia. So social phobia is an intense, irrational, continuous fear of performing in social situations. Uh, this fear of humiliation and embarrassment. And a lot of people have low levels of social phobia. If we were in class and I made you come up and do presentations to the class, most of you, probably all of you, would have some level of fear of performing in that situation. It's when it becomes irrational and to the point where it makes it so you can't function at all that it becomes a social phobia. People with a true social phobia, when it comes to presenting in class, they will not be able to present. They just wouldn't be able to do it. They would be sick that day. They would freeze up, all of those types of things. So a true person with so social phobia is someone who basically it's so bad that they can't function at all. That is different than the normal fear that most people have of presenting to, to groups in front of classes, in front of people. And while I'm talking about that, um, the thing I always recommend is practice, 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 practice. You get to the point where you no longer have that phobia. Uh, when I first started presenting, I, I had fear of presenting to groups. Now I teach, I talk in front of people all the time. Um, and it just came from practice. I did what's called Toastmasters. Toastmasters is a program where you basically give a series of 10 speeches to a group that's doing the same thing. And they, this, and you, well, you're part of the group, you critique others, you get critiqued, and you learn to normalize and reduce the, the fear and stress that comes from public speaking and social situations. On the other hand, on the other side of it, you have specific phobias. Specific phobias are marked in persistent fear um, triggered by or anticipation to exposure to a specific object or situation. So big key here, social phobias and specific phobias are different things. Specific phobias um, are, are like what you see on the right here. Whereas social phobia is that fear of performing in social situations. And there's a long list of specific phobias. This doesn't even begin to get to the list of specific phobias. I mean, you've only got C through G on this list and they, they go all the way through the alphabet. Uh, just some of these are, are interesting that, that you can have a fear of a phobia to constipation. I mean, the clowns one's obvious. Clowns are scary. I don't blame anyone who's got a phobia of clowns. But a, a f fear of work, a fear of horses, things like this. You can go, just go through and, and there's just about anything you can think of there's a fear of. Another type of phobia is agoraphobia. Now, agoraphobia is is um, within the specific phobias, but it's worth being mentioned. It's worth worth talking about because it is separate from them as well. It is because of how detrimental it is, as well as it being slightly common. So we talked about panic disorder, um, and we talked about panic disorder and looked at how that affects people. Agoraphobia is closely related to that. And this actually gets into one of the problems in psychology of when we've got different categories of disorders, how do we determine if somebody has agoraphobia or panic disorder? Because agoraphobia is anxiety about being in places or situations in which escape might be difficult or embarrassing if a panic attack were to occur. So I talked about before how um, people with panic disorder, uh, one of the issues they have is driving because they're afraid they're going to have a panic attack while driving. Agoraphobia has the exact same thing. That is a fear of driving because fear that in, in panic attack, it's going to be difficult to escape from the situation. So it just 
goes to show that um, it, it's there is a lot of overlap between the two, and the it it sometimes becomes difficult to distinguish between two different disorders, which is why they're trying to move to to spectrums to say that people have um, characteristics of many different disorders. This this and this is where they are in that spectrum. The last um, phobia I'll talk about is a phobia that is different than all the rest, and that that should be pointed out. This the, what's called blood injection injury phobia is a phobia that that is has very little to do actually with the other phobias. That is because blood injection injury phobia is a biological phobia. It is not typically a learned phobia. It is a genetic phobia. And what ap ends up happening here is with the sight of blood, injury, infections, different thing, in needles, injections, things like that. So the sight of these types of things, typically blood, um, an individual's heart rate decreases and their blood pressure decreases. What typically ends up happening here is, is the, the individual with this will end up fainting. Um, and as I said, this is a inherited vasovagal response, meaning it's a response of basically uh, blood pressure. So heart rate and blood pressure drop. Onset usually starts in childhood. And um, this is one that almost shouldn't be counted as a phobia. But it is because people with this tend to start having anxiety about the possibility of seeing blood and that can actually cause this response. So it's separate from the rest in that it's not a learned response, it's a inherited response. It's it's 100% genetic and it is a, a response that can cause anxiety because the anxiety about the events occurring. So how do we treat phobias? Um, when it comes to treating phobias, there's various different things we can do. Um, the, the number one thing is CBT. Notice I love CBT. Why I love CBT so much, cognitive behavioral therapy, is because it has the most research supporting it. And CBT isn't a cure-all, but there is CBT that's been modified to treat different, many different disorders. So CBT is the, the type of therapy where we change negative, unhealthy, or distorted thoughts into positive, healthy, or realistic ones. That's the cognitive side. And then the behavioral side is change or disrupt the behaviors by learning and practicing new skills to improve functioning. So CBT is basically a two-pronged approach. One is to change the, the thinking, the negative thinking, the unhealthy thinking, the distorted thinking. The other is to change the negative, unhealthy behavior. Another thing that's used specifically to phobias, it's used in a couple other things too, but phobias is, is, is one of the most common, is exposure therapy. So exposure therapy is where gradual controlled exposure to the anxiety provoking situations. Uh, in um, there is a term called flooding, and that is the term flooding in exposure therapy is where the person is just flooded with it, where it isn't gradual. The person just, okay, you have a fear of heights, let's go skydiving. Uh, you have a, a fear of uh, snakes, how about you go take a bath in snakes? Uh, that type of thing. That's flooding. That is atypical and that doesn't have as much positive efficacy. It doesn't have as much, uh, it isn't as, as supported by the evidence. Gradual therapy though is supported by the evidence. This is controlled where let's say you've got a fear of snakes. So the first thing you do is the therapist sits you down and has you think about snakes. And at the same time you're thinking about snakes, you're doing relaxation techniques. And then, okay, so you, you've thought about snakes. Now let's look at pictures of snakes. Let's have that picture of a snake across the room. Now let's touch the picture of the snake. Now let's watch a video of a snake. Finally, let's handle a little tiny baby snake all the way up to handling a bigger snake. 
or not just handling first, but having a, a tiny snake in the room with you across the room in a cage, and then being closer to it, closer to it, closer to it, and finally being able to handle it. So this is a gradual where you practice relaxation and you train the mind to not be afraid of the, the object or situation that's causing the anxiety. Uh, for social phobia, the treatments tend to be very CBT oriented, explain how fears are learned, help the individual learn new social skills, exposure to the social situations, and just practice being exposed starting through imagining going on from there. There are drug treatments for phobias, but they tend to be problematic long term and um, it basically seems to be due to the placebo effect. So the, the actual drug treatments are not that good at treating it. Let's now look at obsessive compulsive disorder. An obsessive compulsive disorder is an anxiety disorder, and I'm going to say this now and I'll say it later. The obsessive compulsive disorder needs to be broke down into three things that are separate or there are three separate things that people think are OCD, but are not. Only one of them is. You have obsessive compulsive disorder, which we're gonna talk about now. You have obsessive compulsive personality disorders, which we're gonna talk about when we talk about the personality disorders later. It is completely separate from obsessive compulsive disorder. And then you have when people talk about um, having OCD, when in reality they don't, but that is more of obsessive compulsive personality disorder light. Um, it's a lighter version or a minor version of obsessive compulsive personality disorder. When people actually say they have OCD, they're not actually talking about true obsessive compulsive disorder. Let's get into true com obsessive compulsive disorder and look at this and you can see then how it's different than, than people who think that, okay, well, they have to have certain th things in a certain way so they're OCD. No, that's not obsessive compulsive disorder. Obsessive compulsive disorder requires two components. The two components for obsessive compulsive disorder, the first is obsess obsessions. Obsessions are persistent, reoccurring, irrational thoughts, impulses, or images that a person is unable to control and interfere with normal functioning. Obsessions are the anxiety component of obsessive compulsive disorder. It is why it's an anxiety disorder, because obsession, obsessions cause anxiety. Obsessions are the root of anxiety. You've got an obsession about the house burning down. So that is an anxiety about the house burning down. You've got an obsession about the house getting broken into. It's an anxiety about the house getting broken into. Those are two of the most important. You've got an obsession about catching something. So it's an, the obsession is the anxiety about germs. Those are actually the three most common types of obsessions, but there's a long list of obsessions, but they're all anxieties. You have extreme anxiety about something. Then you have the second component required for obsessive compulsive disorder, and that's compulsions. And compulsions are impulses to perform tasks over and over, some senseless behavior or ritual to provide relief from the obsessions. Compulsions are anxiety relievers. That's the, the important component here. People do their compulsions in order to reduce the anxiety from the obsessions. They have anxiety from obsessions. They do the compulsions to reduce that anxiety. So let's look at those three I talked about. The first is the house burning down. The obsession is the, the house is gonna burn down. You're obsessed about it. The compulsion is to double check that you've turned off the stove. Now, that's a normal thing for someone to double check that they've turned off the stove. What is abnormal is when the person is checked to turn off the stove 20 times in the last 10 minutes and they still go check it again. And then they check it again. And then they check it again. That's because even after checking it, they go back and sit down and do something else. That anxiety about burning, the house burning down because the stove was left on is still there. And they've got to check it again and again and again. Obsession about someone breaking into the house. The compulsion is to make sure you lock the door. Lock the door, unlock the door. Lock the door, unlock the door. Lock the door, unlock the door. Over and over again, or a specific number of times, three times, six times. 
that type of thing. So ritualistic behavior where you unlock and lock the door. The problem here is, is the person walks to the car and they're like, oh, did I lock the door? Right after they lock, did I accidentally leave it unlocked in that last rhythm of locking and unlocking? And it's quite often senseless because the person knows that they only leave it at the lock position. But they've got to go back and do it again. And they get back to the door, they unlock, they lock, they unlock, they lock, they unlock, they lock. And then they get to the car, they're driving down the street, and they've got to go back and do it again. This is where OCD becomes a full-on disorder in that it's interfering with normal life functioning. How do we treat this? Um, CBT, exposure therapy, um, some drugs help, SSRIs specifically, but as you know, SSRIs have major side effects, so exposure therapy and CBT tend to be the best here. Another disorder, I just want to uh, kind of talk about a few other disorders that are within the anxiety. One of them, it's a new disorder in um in the DSM and that is body dysmorphic disorder. And this is where you have a preoccupation with some imagined defect in appearance. The defect usually isn't present, but even if it is present, it appears slight to others. So this is where things like you think your ears are too big or you think your nose is too big. A lot of people think their nose is too big. Most people don't even notice. It's it's not even, if and if people notice, oh, the, that person's nose is too big or, or a little bit too big, oh well. Not a big deal. But people with body dysmorphic disorder are going to have anxiety about that body part. And the onset's usually in the early 20s. Course is lifelong. It does have high comorbidity with OCD. There are treatments like SSRIs and exposure and response prevention, just like um, OCD. But here's an issue. People with body dysmorphic disorder especially the ones with a little bit of money, tend to get plastic surgery over and over and over again. It's believed that Michael Jackson had body dysmorphic disorder. He had a bunch of plastic surgeries done. Um, those individuals who have repeated plastic surgeries, they, they, they tend to have this body dysmorphic disorder. They believe something's wrong with them, with their body, and they've got to correct it. Next one we're going to talk about is PTSD post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is a condition that results from experiencing or even witnessing an event that involves actual or threatened trauma. Um, the symptoms of this can include things like avoidance, emotional numbing, reckless self-destructive behavior, interpersonal problems, um, recurring and disturbing memories, nightmares, fear and anxiety has to be at least present at least one month after the incident and it may not even start for months or even years after the incident. That's one of the things that, that needs to be pointed out about PTSD is this is something that can, its onset can come years after the traumatic experience. Um, one of the things that's not here is suicide. There's high rates of suicide in those with PTSD because of that anxiety, just getting away from that anxiety. Best treatment for PTSD is, going back to what I was talking about before, CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. It's produced the best long-term outcomes. There are other treatments, but CBT has produced the best long-term outcomes. It's just a matter of getting the people treatment because a lot of people with PTSD avoid other people avoid therapists, believe that, that the problem is them and it's not something that's treatable. Next disorder we'll talk about is adjustment disorder. So as I said, I'm going to just throw in a few um, extras. So adjustment disorder, um, this is where you have anxious or depressive reactions to life stress. Um, it's milder than PTSD and acute stress disorder that we didn't talk about, um, but acute stress disorder isn't in the DSM-5, but it's still milder than the other stress disorders that we've talked about. And really what ends up happening here is, is it's an individual that daily life stressors tend to affect them more than daily life stressors would affect others. So we talked about stress before and how there's daily life stressors that people go through as well as major life stressors. 
major life events, stuff like that. People with adjustment disorders tend to have those um, life stressors cause more stress than would be normal. Illness anxiety disorder. Um, so this is a disorder that, that used to be called hypochondria. Um, and basically what is going on here is this is an individual that has severe anxiety about the possibility of having or acquiring illnesses or diseases. Um, actual symptoms, if present, are tend to be very mild, uh, but there's this strong sense of disease conviction, strong sense that they have or are going to get a disorder. And medical reassurance doesn't help. Um, they these are the type of people that tend to go from doctor to doctor trying to get second opinion, third opinion, fourth opinion until they get a doctor that tells them what they want. Or if they don't, they just keep going. If they finally are convinced that one thing's not wrong with them, they might start thinking a different thing's wrong with them, that type of thing. And this is, again, an anxiety disorder because they've got this anxiety about these illnesses. And for those of you going into medical fields, this is actually a major problem in, med in medical fields and, and with insurance companies. So people w that have been diagnosed with illness anxiety disorder, they'll have uh, what's classified as a gateway physician. A, their insurance company mandates that they go to that physician before they can go to, uh, the, to that doctor before they can go to any other doctor. And that doctor dictates whether they actually have something going on or not. And those doctors, uh, they, they're specialist doctors whose job is to deal with people with illness, anxiety disorder, but at the same time, they, they are trained to, to look really closely because someone with illness, anxiety disorder, if they actually have something start occurring to them, if, if the doctor isn't looking close, it can be missed because of just this belief that they're faking again like everything else. Next disorder we'll talk about is attachment disorders. Um, and really, we're, we're out of the anxiety disorders, though attachment disorders, there is some anxiety component, but we're out of the true anxiety disorders into some of the other disorders that are out there. So attachment disorders are developmentally inappropriate behaviors in children. Uh, this is where a child's un, unable or unwilling to form normal attachment or relationships with caregivers typically results as typically occurs as a result of abuse or neglect in early childhood. So attachment disorders are in individuals that can even be adults who cannot form attachments normally due to the poor attachments that figures that they had as a child. Why is this still kind of an anxiety disorder? Because people have anxiety about attachments, anxiety, fear that people are just going to abandon them, fear that people are going to harm them. So the anxiety component is there. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on the, the somatic symptom and related disorders. Uh, I could go into these much more detail, but uh, these are disorders that are interesting, but we're just not going to, to go into them. Abnormal psych will go into them more, but these are disorders that are marked by a pattern of recurring significant body, bodily symptoms, somatic symptoms that extend over several years. These can be things like pain, vomiting, paralysis, even blindness that are not under voluntary control. The somatic symptoms uh, are symptoms that are typically biologically related that have no physical cause, typically a just a psychological cause. It's interesting to talk about here, paralysis and blindness caused just by psychological. And these aren't people faking. And again, there's no biological cause, but these are things where basically the brain, due to whatever reason, psychological trauma, that type of thing, have these other physical symptoms. 
So if you go into a biomedical field, it's something to still be aware of that some people will have these physical symptoms that you would normally have diagnosed as due to a physical cause that have no known physical cause. And things like the blindness are interesting in that your brain can just stop pro properly processing sight due to a trauma. Not a physical trauma, a psychological trauma. And it can be, it can come back later or it might not even come back later. And like I said, I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Just know that the, the somatoform, they used to be called somatoform, now they're called somatic symptom and related disorders. Um, the somatic symptom disorders are, um, can be pretty detrimental because there's no physical cause of a physical disorder. Let's start with the mood disorders. So mood disorders are essentially gross deviations in mood. So this is where you've got a prolonged disturbed emotional state that affects almost all of your thoughts, your feelings, your behaviors. And when we talk about mood disorders, we're looking at and I, I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier in the semester, but we're looking at mood as a, a spectrum. And you've got essentially different levels or types of mood episodes. You can have positive mood, negative mood, uh, heightened or lowered. So when we talk about mood disorders, we're essentially looking at not just depression, but elevated mood as well. So we're going to look at these different episodes. We're going to look at things like major depressive episodes, manic episodes, and hypomanic episodes. Three different things there. So what are major, what is a major depressive episode? A major depressive episode is a period of depression, a period of extremely low mood. So it's a depressed mood and or loss of pleasure. term for loss of pleasure is anhedonia, anhedonia, which is basically where you don't get pleasure in the activities that you got before. Maybe you enjoyed watching a sport before and you no longer enjoy that. You enjoyed playing a sport, you no longer enjoy that. Those types of things. You enjoyed reading books, you no longer enjoy that has to last for most of the day, nearly every day for at least two weeks to be counted as a major depressive episode. And other symptoms along will, will be included, indecisiveness, feelings of worthlessness, fatigue, change in appetite, so it can be an increase in appetite or a decrease in appetite, restlessness, sleep disturbance, it can be increased sleep or decreased sleep, feelings of being slowed down, those types of things. A manic episode, on the other hand, is a elevated mood, expansive mood, and it has to, to be counted as a full manic episode. It has to last at least a week. Uh, some people have manic episodes that are less, and when we talk about disorders, one thing I haven't been talking about, but this is a good place to just kind of throw it on, is that uh, when we talk about disorders and the diagnostic manual and how they're diagnosed, there are now what's called specifiers. And there has been, but now there's more specifiers. So specifiers are basically, you've got this disorder with a specifier, and a specifier basically means you've got this disorder, but this. Or you've got this disorder with the addition of this. So one of the specifiers for, for manic um, is that you have manic in a short burst. So maybe only a few hours to a day rather than lasting at least one week. So symptoms of mania, uh, inflated self-esteem, decreased need for sleep, excessive talkiness, talkativeness, as well as fast, talking really fast, flight of ideas, sense that thoughts are racing, easily being distractible, um, increasing goal-directed activity, excessive involvement in pleasurable but risky behaviors, these types of things. Um, I, and it really needs to cause an impairment in normal function. Whenever I'm talking about manic episodes, 
I, I have to include talking about my cousin. My cousin has, and we'll get to it, is bipolar, but when she has her manic episodes, she basically has to be institutionalized. Because when she has her manic episodes, she gets so far to the expansive side, elevated mood side, that um, one of, I think it's the second time she was institutionalized, she thought she was Jesus reborn. She was completely convinced she was Jesus reborn. And it just, that's the way her thinking was at that moment in time. Uh, another time, she'd gathered up all of her belongings in the middle of the night, in all of her clothes, and in her arms. She didn't put them in a bag or anything. She just had them bundled up in her arms and went in the middle of the night and stood in the middle of the road. Because she thought someone was coming to get her. No one was coming to get her, but she thought someone was coming to get her. Um, at other times, she thought other people were possessed by demons. Uh, stuff like that. She even accused me once of being possessed by a demon. So it's just, that's when these these manic episodes, it's not necessarily just positive. It's just really just heightened, elevated cognitive and physical symptoms that impair normal functioning. Hypomanic, though, on the other hand, are shorter, less severe versions of manic episodes. So I talked about the specifier with manic that you can have them for shorter. Um, hypomanic is is mostly along those lines, but it also has to be less severe. Um, for most people, it has to last more at least four days, and but the really fewer and milder symptoms. So people with hypomania, there might not be as many issues with um, with impairment to behavior. So typically people with hypomanic, it might not even be problematic in and of itself, but people that are hypomanic, it tends to occur within the context of a larger mood disorder. So they have depression as well. And that's what we'll get to when we're talking about bipolar is one of the big issues is the, the swings between these states can actually cause some pretty severe issues. Um, Example here of more mild symptoms is people who go on shopping sprees when they're hypomanic, but not necessarily spending all their money. Uh, I, I have a friend who is, has hypomania, and one of the times that she was manic, she spent $400 on Wish, something like that. It, it didn't bankrupt her, but it's obviously stuff that it, it was stuff that she didn't need or all of it she didn't need. And wouldn't have bought if she was in a normal state of mind. So it's again less severe, not necessarily impairing behavior. Now let's actually talk about the. So now that we've looked at the types of mood, let's look at the disorders that are there. Um, and we'll talk about first the two that are unimodal. Um, unimodal meaning there's only one mood that's that's an issue and these two are both with depression so the first one is persistent depressive disorder so this is an individual that for at least two years has had depressive symptoms on at least 50 percent of days they have dep depressed mood most of the day they can have no more than two months symptom free over this time um, and the symptoms of someone with persistent depressive disorder can last unchanged for many, many years, 20 or more years. And it basically includes uh, mild depression. So this is someone who has mild depression for long periods of time. Now, there might be major depressive episodes that occur during this. But for the most part, this is an individual who just has mild depression most of the time, most of their life. On the other hand, major depressive disorder is someone who has major depression uh, lasting at least two weeks. This is someone who won't have interest in, any, in anything at all. Uh, they get no pleasure from activities, uh, problems with eating, sleeping, thinking, concentrating, making decisions, energy, thinking about suicide, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, those types of things. Someone with persistent depressive disorder 
isn't necessarily going to have these, they just have this general low mood. Someone with major depressive disorder has these major depressive symptoms. Now let's talk about the bimodal disorders, mood disorders. And these are ones that include both heightened and depressed moods, so both depression and mania. We'll first talk about bipolar one. So bipolar one is fluctuations between depression and mania. Um, the manic episodes will go on for at least a week. The person tends to be unusually euphoric, cheerful, um, high on life. Uh, also great self-esteem, little need for sleep, rapid speech, frequent racing thoughts, easily distracted. Um, these are the types of things I was talking about with the manic episode. So bipolar one is having full mania, mania and full depression. That's what the bipolar one is classified. Bipolar two, on the other hand, is having full depression, but instead of having mania, having hypomania. So bipolar two is basically uh, those lower symptoms, those, those symptoms of mania that are not as detrimental, not as extreme. So what causes mood disorders? Um, just about everything you can think of that we've been talking about. Genetic conditions, neurological conditions, chemical, physiological. Um, they predispose someone, but then you've got your psychological factors and your uh, personality, cognitive styles. You've got environment as a big component. So basically, the, the mood disorders are, are your prime example of the diathesis stress model. That is environmental factors interacting with predispositions to result in a disorder. As far as treatment, um, when it comes to uh, depression, major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder, um, antidepressant drugs are common. Uh, these have been shown to lately to be not as effective. Um, but things like SSRIs, uh, other things that increase uh, specific neurotransmitters, uh, things that are regulated in that that are involved in regulation of moods and emotions, these are, are drugs that tend to be prescribed. However, what's been found is is that therapy can be and is often just as effective as drugs. On the other hand, mania, this is one of the, the few times where I'll say that um, therapy and CBT and stuff like that really don't have much of an effect. This and, and there's one other we'll talk about later that are like this, that really the only way we've found to fully treat mania, full mania, is with drug treatments. And these are drug treatments are mood stabilizers that basically um, stabilize the, the, the mood of the individual. However, the individual often feels stifled with it. And one of the problems is that um, individuals with mania that are bipolar, they want to get back to manic. They actually enjoy being manic. So it's hard to get them to stay on their drugs. They might go off their drugs in an effort to try and get back to manic. And what ends up happening is, is yeah, they get back to manic, but then they get back to depressed. And that big transition from mania to depression causes suicide. Bipolar, bipolar 1 specifically, has one of the, the largest incidents of suicide in psychological disorders because of that big transition from manic to depressed. Actually, right here's one good time to talk about it. I'm not going to talk about the eating disorders, but the psychological disorder that has the highest incidence of suicide is anorexia. Just interesting side note. Another treatment for mood disorders is uh, electroconvulsive therapy. This works on depression mainly. Um, Electroconvulsive therapy is when electrical currents are, are run through the brain, causes a seizure. It's actually uh, 
got a lot of efficacy now as being an effective treatment for depression, those with major depressive and persistent depressive disorder. Uh, it, do, it does have an effect of memory loss. Uh, we talked when we talked about memory, one of the things I said, the consolidations of memories takes hours. Well, this, these electrical currents being run through the brain interrupt that, so you'll lose hours of memory, sometimes more. And again, this is, this is an effective treatment, and it's, it's kind of, it used to be used, then it stopped being used, and now it's starting to be used again because it's being shown to be an effective treatment when everything else fails, obviously. Um, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, is another way that's used. This is more non-invasive, and it just basically puts pulses of magnetic energy into the brain. Um, deep brain stimulation, uh, this is another type of thing that, that works. What is going on with these biomedical treatments like electroconvulsive therapy, TMS, brain stimulation, deep brain stimulation? Why do these work? Well, it's believed that these work because one of the big problems of depression is rumination. What is rumination? Rumination is when an individual basically ruminates, continues to think about the thing that is causing them to be depressed. So they, they do nothing but nonstop think about them, think about it. Then they think about being depressed because of it, which causes them to be more depressed, which causes them to think about the thing that caused them to be depressed. And it's a constant cycle of the brain is just running through this constant cycle of rumination. So, and that's what keeps the person in the depressive state. It's believed that these biomedical treatments actually interrupt that rumination. And by interrupting that rumination, it allows the person to, to get out of that depressed state. It breaks the chain in a sense. Another type of um, therapy that's been used uh, in, is getting a lot of uh, research and, and support is exercise as a treatment for depression. Uh, so exercise compared to uh, comparing the three groups, exercise alone, antidepressants alone, and exercise plus antidepressants, exercise alone was effective as any of the other treatments and showed the lowest risk of relapse long term. So there's more and more information showing that exercise re reduces and controls depression. What are some things you can do to deal with minor depression? So a lot of people have minor depression in their day-to-day -day lives, especially when we're in a situation now where everybody's locked at home and this that can cause these depression symptoms to occur. Uh, what you can do is work on your social skills. Monitor what the social interactions to identify what's going wrong. Make efforts to change behaviors that are contributing to negative interactions. Avoid blaming yourself for failures and take credit for your successes. This goes back to attribution theory that we talked about. Eliminate negative thoughts. This is a big one. So monitor your thoughts and identify negative patterns, then replace them with positive ones. I talked before earlier in the semester about how, well, when you're told don't think of a purple elephant, you, you can't help but think of a purple elephant. However, when you're monitoring negative thoughts and you work on, okay, whenever I think of a purple elephant, I'm also going to think of a pink rhino. And the pink rhino is positive. So now, whenever you start thinking about that negative thing, you think about positive thing as well. Or you do relaxation techniques, things like that. Talk, just talking to people can help alter the brain functions associated with depression. So it's really big of just controlling the negative thoughts and improving social skills. And I recommend everybody practice effective techniques of doing this, even if you don't have depression yourself, because they can make you a better person. All right, next we're gonna talk about conversion disorder. We're just gonna look at a couple different um, rapid fire disorders. Conversion disorder, also called functional neurological symptom disorder. Conversion disorder is when you've got altered motor or sensory function that's inconsistent with medical conditions, not better explained by another disorder. Um, it's often can suggestive of a neurological problem, but no problem exists. 
Uh, this is similar to the one we talked about in the last set of slides. Facetious disorder, the, on the other hand, is when an individual purposefully fakes symptoms. So this may induce physical symptoms, uh, the individual may induce physical symptoms or just pretend to have them. So they might self-harm to pretend they have them or just pretend they have them even with nothing. The big thing with facetious disorder for it to be counted as facetious disorder is there needs to be no obvious external gains for it to work, for it to be counted as, not for it to work, for it to be counted as a facetious disorder. The only external gain may be the sympathy, but it, it can't be uh, something like trying to get out of work or trying to get out of the military. Uh, that's what is called malingering. Malingering is when you fake physical symptoms or cause yourself physical symptoms to get out of something. So there's an external gain. The facetious disorder is basically only for an internal gain. Then there's facetious disorder imposed on another. This is Munchausen by proxy. You may have heard of it. Um, and this is when uh, the it is now inducing symptoms on another person in order to gain the the sympathy and attention of others so this is where typically where a caregiver will will induce symptoms in a child or an adult that they're an older adult that they're caring for in order to receive attention and sympathy they they might po a mother might poison her child slowly in order for the child to be sick and then receive sympathy from others for caring for a sick individual. So this is Munchausen by proxy or facetious disorder imposed on another. Pretty negative, negative issues here. And definitely an individual that, that should be possibly incarcerated for this type of behavior. Okay, the next set of disorders we're going to talk about are dissociative type disorders. So dissociative type disorders are going to be characterized by having a disruption or breakdown in your consciousness, memory, sense of identity, these types of things. So there's uh, five different components that can come into here. Um, amnesia, so loss of, and that's we'll talk about that first, dissociative amnesia. This is where the inability to recall important personal information or events uh, tends to be associated with stressful or traumatic events, but not when there is no brain trauma. So dissociative amnesia is someone who may be um, a guy who's going through a divorce who just wanders off and forgets things that are going on, or someone who's going through a lot of stress who just forgets the important information, personal information, even uh, even who they are, that type of thing. And some people with dissociative amnesia, it can go on for 10, 20 years before they get their memory back. The other is a dissociative fugue, which is um, disturb disturbance marked by suddenly and unexpectedly traveling away from home, place, or work and being able to recall one's past. So amnesia is the top one. That's the one you see in purple on the right. This dissociative fugue is more of identity confusion, which you see in green. And this is where a person, um, people with dis dissociative fugues, they wander off and they may even adopt a new life and live in that life for many years before um, realizing uh, or coming to their senses. So dissociative fugue is, is, is very much related to dissociative amnesia. Um, dissociative fugue, some people will, with this, will just wander for hours or days and have no memory of that time when they were gone. So that's a, another thing with dissociative fugue is they may have no memory of what happened when they were in that fugue state. And brain scans have shown that they, these people are not faking. And that's one thing I, I need to say here before I get to some of these other ones, and we'll talk about it actually at the end. Um, can these be faked? Uh, yes, some people do fake these, but we've, through brain scans, uh, been able to tell that some individuals are not faking. These are actual disorders that do occur. 
Um, the next one is depersonalization, derealization. This is actually two disorders kind of mixed into one. So that was the next two wedges of the pie from the previous one. Not the wedges of the pie from here, but depersonalization, derealization is where basically a person has a sense of unreality. So they don't feel that the world is real around them or they feel that a part of their body is not real or not theirs. And these feelings interfere with life and functioning. Um, some people who feel that, let's say, their hand is not their hand. They will cut off their hand because they, they are so um, de depersonalized from it. And, or, again, they might be someone just feeling like they're not in their own body. Or that the world around them is not real. So, it's when we look at depersonalization, derealization, there's just the sense that either our bodies or the world around us are not real or are not ours. Um, and, it, and this is only diagnosed if the problem, primary problem involves one of these. Um, however, similar symptoms can occur in other disorders like panic disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, this feeling of the world not being real, but that's usually due to those stressors, not due to um, just the internal conditions. Last one we'll talk about is um, dissociative disorder, also called dissociative identity disorder, formerly called multiple personality disorder. And this is when an individual has two or more distinct identities or personality states, each with its own patterns of perceiving, thinking about, or relating to the world. Um, these identities display unique behaviors, voices, postures, there tends to be a quick transition from one personality to another. An individual may have as many as 200 different personalities. And even within one sentence may transition between multiple different personalities. And again, like I said before, this one can be fake, but there's a lot of evidence out there that it hasn't been. Let me actually get to the next slide and I'll talk about that more. So um, some, sim some people do fake. Um, and it's been shown that that they uh, people are, are more likely when suggested by therapists and or some are doing it consciously, some are even faking un, unconsciously. However, some dissociative identity patients are not faking. Uh, studies have revealed that that there's changes in brain functioning that occur when you're doing a brain scan and they switch between personalities and their brain functioning alters. Our brain functioning in, in some ways is like a fingerprint. And with individuals that truly have DID, their brain functioning changes from one personality to another. Physiological changes that occur. That's one of the interesting ones. Uh, even read a, a study that was done on a person whose eye color would change when they were in different personalities. And we're not talking about going from blue to brown, but we're talking about someone who has hazel eyes who's People who have hazel eyes, their eye color tends to change depending on the weather and a few things, but changes slightly. But we're talking about great changes rapidly in eye color, in um, cognitive functioning, and all of these things. So it's it's been the one person had a identity that one of their identities was, was blind, and their pupils did not react to light normally when they were in that identity. So it just shows that, that there are, while there might be people, there are people, we know people do fake this. While there are people who fake dissociative identity disorder, it is a real disorder though, because we've got enough evidence now from brain scans and other physiological exams to show that the, these, um, these individuals are switching between personalities. All right, next let's talk about the personality disorders. So personality disorder is a persistent pattern of emotions, cognitions, and behavior that results in enduring. So personality is enduring. Personality disorders are enduring as well. Enduring emotional distress for the person affected or others it may cause difficulty with work. It may cause difficulty with relationships. There is one issue with personality disorders though is that they're egocentric. What does that mean? That means that the the individuals with personality disorders actually tend to feel that that is 
who they are that is part of their identity and they don't feel that treatment's necessary. Someone get, who has severe depression, they, they may seek out treatment because they've got depression. Someone who has uh, antisocial personality disorder, they don't tend to seek out treatment. They tend to only get treatment when they're forced to by the courts because they don't feel that anything is wrong with them. Uh, your book's wrong. Um, the DSM-5 still has 10 specific personality disorders that are organized into three clusters. Let's look at those clusters. Um, so these three clusters that are in the DSM-5, cluster A is going to be the odd or eccentric cluster that's going to include paranoid, schizoid, schizotypal personality disorders. Cluster B is more dramatic, emotional, or erratic, or having to do with lack of empathy. This is antisocial, borderline, histrionic, and narcissistic personality disorders. And cluster C is the fearful or anxious one. And this is avoidant, dependent, and obsessive compulsive personality disorders. Let's start with paranoid personality disorder. We're going to start with that first one. So paranoid personality disorder is about pervasive and unjustified mistrust and suspicion. Um, there are few meaningful relationships. Uh, very sensitive to criticism, and the individual has a poor quality of life. I should point out, I said before uh, in, in another set of slides that uh, disorders are like spectrums. And uh, one of the big spectrums that, that needs to be um, expanded is schizophrenia. We're going to talk about schizophrenia in just a little bit. But Paranoid personality disorders is actually one of three of the personality disorders that has a genetic link to schizophrenia. So people who have um, schiz if you have a relative with schizophrenia, your likelihood of having paranoid personality disorder is increased. And we'll see when we talk about um, schizophrenia, um, one of the, the big things with schizophrenia is uh, people who have mistrust of others. So paranoid personality disorder is kind of just like having one symptom of schizophrenia. The next is schizoid. Um, schizoid personality disorder is a pervasive pattern of detachment from social relationships, uh, a very uh, limited range of emotions in, in interpersonal situations, and this one actually has overlap with autism. So it's very, again, we're getting these spectrums and showing that these disorders aren't necessarily distinct. There is a quite a bit of overlap with schizoid and autism because it's all about social relationships and social interactions. Uh, so the person with schizoid is going to have a lack of close friends and possibly even uh, suspicion towards others, that type of thing. The next personality disorder we're going to talk about is schizotypal personality disorder. Very similar in name to schizoid, and in some ways it is similar because there is that overlap of lack of close friends, um, suspicion of others, but I mean it even goes beyond that. And so this is someone who's got a dress. Uh, they might dress in a way that is unusual. Uh, they tend to be more socially isolated, highly suspicious, as I said. They may have magical thinking, so ideas of reference and illusions. Magical thinking, ideas of reference, what that actually means is is more along the lines of, um, so I explained how my cousin, who had bipolar, she thought she was Jesus reborn. That is an example of this. So the, the person might think that they have superpowers, and they may even... Um, have illusions um, as well as delusions. Uh, many meet the criteria for major depression, so there's a high overlap there. And this is actually classified as a milder form of schizophrenia, whereas the, the first one we talked about earlier, which was the, the paranoid, it has one part of schizophrenia. Schizotypal is, has many components of schizophrenia but has them in a more mild form so 
schizotypal personality disorder is often called schizophrenia light and this is another one that has a strong genetic component to schizophrenia another argument for schizophrenia being a spectrum that is that if you have a relative who has schizophrenia your chances of having schizotypal is increased let's move on to cluster b cluster b is a fun cluster so cluster b the first one we're going to talk about is the most detrimental of the personality disorders probably one of the most detrimental of the disorders there is out there and that is antisocial personality disorder antisocial personality disorder is classified as a failure to comply with social norms a violations of the rights of others irresponsible impulsive deceitful behavior a lack of conscious empathy or remorse so that's a big component of this lack of empathy or remorse often called sociopathy or psychopathy Neither of those are actual terms in psychology, by the way. It is antisocial personality disorder that's going on here. Um, and the, the individual may be very charming, um, but they also may be very interpersonally manipulative. Uh, so antisocial is, is one of those that's classified as really an individual that doesn't have the same moral compunctions as others. Uh, they may learn what the the societal norms and rules are and adhere and follow them because they know that that's going to keep them out of jail but their motivation for staying out of jail isn't one of or th of doing the behaviors isn't more being morally right or wrong their motivation for doing the behaviors is to avoid the punishment because then they stay out of jail uh, individuals with antisocial personality disorder um, there's a very disproportionately high rate of them incarcerated in prison there's also a disproportionately high rate as ceos because the the belief is to raise that high in many structure in many um corporate structures you have to basically have a reduced amount of empathy and remorse because to do the things you have to do to help to make a business succeed you might have to fire people you might have to make decisions that harm others so this is in there's a lot of people who have antisocial personality disorder that are are not in prison these are these are the type of people again they may be charming but they're they're avoiding prison as a way of um, basically continuing to keep doing what they want to do uh, I am a very big fan of uh treat rather than incarcerate when you've got an individual with a psychological disorder who is doing something wrong who has done something wrong i would rather we as a society treat that individual for what the the disorder that basically influenced them doing something wrong even with things like um there's pretty severe things out there some pretty severe and harmful things that that i'm of the opinion we should treat them yes they might need to be put into a mental health facility to be treated but i'm of the opinion we should treat the disorder not incarcerate the person however this is the one time that i will say that that isn't really effective in certain circumstances that is anti people with antisocial personality disorder really there is no effective treatment that we found for this so in many instances the only answer may be incarceration because these are individuals that the, the, we have been tracked and even when their people therapists try to treat them for the disorder that they might look like they're they're better they might look like they're they're cured they might look like their disorder their personality disorder is reduced and really what it turns out they're just faking to get through the treatment so that they can go back to doing whatever they want to do so this is the one time you'll ever hear me say incarceration may be better um, because there's really no effective treatment even those with uh, uh, sadistic rape even those who do that we've found ways to treat them like blocking testosterone and then their their sadistic urges go away 
I'm not saying they, they should be freely just let go. I'm just saying there, we've got ways to treat people like that. And in cases like that, it's better to treat the disorder than just lock them away from society. However, in cases where there is no other option, locking people away from society needs to still be an option. People, Some people with antisocial personality disorder fit that criteria because nothing is going to change their harmful behavior. I should say antisocial personality disorder is primarily diagnosed in men. It's rarely diagnosed in women, even though it is diagnosed in women, but it is primarily a male disorder. That being said, let's look at the next slide. Next slide is histrionic personality disorder. Histrionic personality disorder is overly dramatic and sensational individuals. They may be sexually provocative. They, they often are impulsive. They often need to be the center of attention. Um, they, they are perceived as shallow. This disorder is primarily diagnosed in women. Sometimes diagnosed in men, but primarily in women. What has actually been found is, is what researchers into these personality disorders believe, is that these two personality disorders, antisocial personality disorder and histrionic personality disorder, are actually the same thing. They're just different presentations in different genders. So those who are more feminine tend to present as histrionic. Those who are more masculine tend to present as antisocial personality disorder. So it's a, the, the one thing with histrionic, histrionic is, is there is a lack of empathy and a lack of remorse. And this is where, the, again, the, then they're perceived as shallow as a result. So it's, it's almost looked at now by researchers as, Histrionic and antisocial are just two sides of the same coin. Just one is more masculine features and one is more feminine features. And the sexually provocative, I should just point out real quick, the sexually provocative here, it's usually, it's not due to an increased desire for sex. It's, it's due to an increased use of sex appeal to get what one wants. Okay, the third disorder here is borderline. Uh, so borderline personality disorder is somebody who has unstable moods, um, a lot of impulsivity, fear of abandonment, poor self-image, possibly even doing things like self-mutilation or suicidal gestures. There's high core morbidity with this and the mood disorders. And it, it really comes down to this, this unstable mood, unstable personality. And then the final one in cluster B, and that's narcissistic personality disorder. Again, this one should not be confused with um, histrionic, even though there's some overlap here. So even though histrionic was needing to be the, the center of attention and narcissistic needs to be the center of attention or it has a somebody with narcissistic personality disorder has a strong preoccupation with receiving attention. There is other differences though. Um, this is more of about being highly sensitive to criticism, highly arrogant, highly envious of others. Someone with histrionic thinks that they're the best. Someone with narcissistic is envious of someone else who is the best. Um, so there's just this unreasonable sense of self-importance. They think that they that that someone with narcissistic personality disorder thinks that that they are the most important thing, even if they're not necessarily the best. Anybody who becomes better than them, they become envious of and tries to bring them down, tear them down. A very me first attitude, um, a very uh, just manipulative, arrogant, desiring to be the center of attention. Uh, you see narcissistic parents, there's a real good subreddit out there raised by narcissists where people explain how their narcissistic parents have to just, anytime their attention is directed towards anyone other than that narcissist, that narcissist has to try and direct the attention to them. Uh, you find a lot of problems with this, like individuals who are at a wedding, 
who are getting married and who, who one of their parents is a narcissist. At that wedding, the narcissist will try to direct attention towards themselves away from the, the couple getting married or at the reception specifically because that's a, a time where all the focus is on the couple getting married. The narcissist doesn't like not being the center of attention. Let's get into the cluster C. So cluster C, the first one is avoidant. This is extreme sensitivity to the opinions of others. So as a result, they're, they're, they're really, they're highly, not, I wouldn't say even offended. They're highly bothered by criticism. So they avoid interpersonal relationships as a way to avoid the criticism. Whereas the, the, the narcissist doesn't like criticism, but craves the interpersonal relationships, the avoidant personality disorder individual um, is, doesn't like criticism, but will avoid any relationships, any interactions, um, because they've got anxiety about the opinions of others or, ang or they fear rejection those types of things. So someone with avoidant has extremely low self-esteem. The next one is dependent personality disorder. Um, dependent personality disorder is the person that's going to um, basically rely on others to make any major or minor life decisions for them. Uh, they've got a extreme of fear of abandonment. So the, the previous one, the avoidant had a fear of rejection dependent has a fear of abandonment. So they t these people tend to be clingy, um, very submissive. Uh, they, they tend to do whatever their partner says or wants because they fear being abandoned by their partner. The, the sad thing with dependent personality disorder is people who are dependent uh, tend to be abuse victims because they'll get in relationships and they'll do anything for their partner and including be abused. So there's some definite huge side effects to dependent personality disorder. And then the last one is obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And I told you before, don't confuse this with obsessive compulsive disorder. And don't confuse this with people saying they have OCD. So obsessive compulsive personality disorder is someone who has excessive and rigid fixation in doing things a certain way. And these are the types of people who will be extremely perfectionistic, orderly, and tend to be emotionally shallow as a result. Uh, if they're working with a group of people, they'll be unwilling to delegate tasks because they're, they are, they know that others will do them wrong, that they're the only ones who can do things right. Um, but people with this personality disorder have trouble with spontaneity because there's the rigid fixed way of doing things. They can't do things spontaneously. But obsessions and compulsions are actually rare. So obsessive compulsive personality disorder, OCPD, is this really rigid fixed way of doing things. It's really very specific. It's they're inflexible. They're very organized. And people with OCPD actually tend to not get jobs done. They won't get jobs done for two reasons. One reason, either they'll take so much responsibility that they'll run out of time. And along those lines, they've got, they, they're, they're so specific about it that they have to keep doing it until they get it right. And they won't ever get it right. So they never get it done. And then there's the other people with OCPD who have anxiety about doing things perfect. And because they know they can't do it perfect, they don't even start. So they tend, people with OCPD tend to become huge procrastinators because they can't um, um, complete a task per correctly because they're so stopped by perfectionism. Okay, so just summary of those personality disorders before we move on to schizophrenia. Some, a personality disorder is a long-standing pattern. Uh, it begins early in development, runs a chronic course, lifetime course. Uh, disagreement does exist in how to categorize these, though, and that really comes down to this categorical versus dimensional approach 
and how a lot of these personality disorders should be dimensional and not categorical. And um, little is known about causes or treatment, mainly because most people with personality disorders don't seek out treatment unless they're mandated by the courts. Actually, the, the personality disorder that's been studied the most is antisocial personality disorder because that's the one that's most likely to be mandated by the courts to get psychological treatment. So they're the people we, we know more about. Let's shift into the final topic then, and that is schizophrenia. Everybody's favorite topic in, in psychology, so that's the one, the last one we'll talk about before we get to um, the, the last set of slides, which is just some finishing up on treatment stuff. So schizophrenia is characterized by a broad spectrum of cognitive and emotional dysfunctions, it includes delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, inappropriate emotions. You can see that there's a little bit of overlap here between this and some of those personality disorders, a little bit of overlap between this and mania, and a little bit of overlap between this and autism. And again, this is why it, diagnosing and treating disorders can be difficult because there's so much overlap between these different disorders. There are three symptom clusters in schizophrenia. It used to be we classified people as subtypes of schizophrenia. We no longer do that. Schizophrenia is now a spectrum. It's not a wide enough spectrum, but it is a spectrum. And we don't have these subtypes like we used to. So if you read your book, your book talks a lot about the subtypes of schizophrenia. Those no longer exist. You just have schizophrenia or you don't, and then you can have specifiers, meaning what symptoms of schizophrenia you have. And these, there's three different symptom clusters. There's first the positive symptom cluster. The positive symptom cluster is going to include delusions and hallucinations. So delusions are our basic feature of madness. This is where we have a gross misrepresentation of reality, where we represent reality as something different than it is. Um, delusions of grandeur are one. So delusions of grandeur are delusions that we are greater than we are. Full-on, complete delusions of grandeur are where we get into magical thinking, where we, we think we can fly, or we think we have superpowers, or we think we have psychic abilities, or even beyond that into those thinking of like the, that we're Jesus reborn, that type of thing. Uh, delusions of persecution, on the other hand, are the delusions where we, we view that where people are out to get us, everyone's out to get us. And this is where you'll get the types that are more prone to believing conspiracy theories and stuff like that. I only listed two delusions here, but there's actually a dozen different types of delusions that you can have. I just wanted to give the overview of the delusions. Just note that there are many different types of delusions. I kind of talked about magical thinking and stuff like that, um, that are out there that, that people with schizophrenia can have that basically alter their perceptions of reality. And then on the other hand, the other side, the other positive symptom is hallucinations. This is where an individual experiences a sensory event without the environmental input being present. And this can involve all of the senses, tasting something when not eating, smelling something that, that's not there, having skin sensations when not being touched, uh, seeing something that's not there. Uh, the most common is actually auditory. The, while media always portrays it as visual hallucinations, the most common hallucinations are auditory. And anytime I talk about uh, uh, hallucinations, I have to point out this, that when uh, they, these aren't people making this up. These aren't people thinking they're hearing something when their mind isn't really hearing anything. Yes, there's no external stimuli, but brain scans of people with schizophrenia that are having hallucinations have shown that brain regions activate as if they are hearing something. So let's, or seeing something or feeling something. So let's talk about vision whereas the optic nerve doesn't activate. So they're, they're, they're having an hallucination. They think they're seeing something. They think they're seeing a person. They're, the brain scans have shown that the, the optic nerve is not activating. So they're, they're not actually seeing something. However, 
the occipital lobe is activating. So in their mind, they are actually seeing something. This isn't just them thinking they're seeing something. Their mind is actually seeing something that's not there. And the same is true when we look at auditory hallucinations, that the, the, the actual ear is not sensing anything. The auditory nerve isn't sensing anything, but the brain regions responsible for hearing are actually activating as if they're hearing something. So that's just scary to think about when you think about that they are actually seeing and hearing things that aren't there. It's not just they think they are. And as I said, most common is auditory. Uh, if you get a chance, I didn't add any videos to the slides, but if you get a chance, there's a set of videos out there that are um, made by people with schizophrenia or made on the advice of people with schizophrenia. And one of them is what it's like to go into the doctors or going to get a prescription at a pharmacy um, and what it's like to be someone with auditory schizophrenia. And the person walks into the empty pharmacy, there might be one or two people in there, and it sounds like they're in a crowd. There's just so many voices that, and most of them are indistinguishable. Most of the auditory hallucin hallucinations are, are not distinguishable as speech. But every once in a while, a few words of speech do come to the front. And the person's walking up to the counter and a, a, it comes up, don't get it, man. Don't get it. They're, the, 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 the guy's trying to poison you. That's poison. That drug is poison. He's trying to poison you. Don't get it. Run away. Go away. He's trying to poison you. And just th that type of thing over and over and over again. Now imagine being an individual with schizophrenia and you have to go buy your medications and you are constantly hearing voices telling you that that medication is poison and that person at the counter is trying to poison you. You can understand why a lot of people with schizophrenia don't end up taking their medications as a result. So that's the positive symptoms cluster. Next is the negative symptoms cluster. And the negative symptoms, so the positive was the addition of something, the addition of a delusion or hallucination. Negative symptoms is the absence or insufficiency of something. So these are, and you see a lot of A words here, um, avolition or apathy is a lack of initiation and persistence in behaviors. Elogia is relative absence of speech. Um, Adedonia, I talked about this one earlier, lack of pleasure or indifference in pleasurable activities. Um, effective flattening, which is little expression or emotion. Um, asociality, which is lack of interest in social interactions. Uh, there's, uh, there's a bunch of them, this is just a few of them, where you just have this reduced sense of or reduced levels of normal behavior, interest, activity. And then the final symptom cluster is disorganized. So the disorganized symptoms cluster is where you basically have confused or abnormal speech, behavior, or emotion. Um, behavior can include body movements, things like that. Um, somebody who's having the, the, the speech parts of disorganized, disorganized speech might have things like cognitive slipping, slippage, which is incoherent speech. Um, tangentiality, where they'll go off on tangents. Uh, loose associations, so conversations in unrelated directions, these types of things. And this is actually, so um, schizotypal, the, these are the types of things that, that people have that in schizotypal that don't necessarily turn into full schizophrenia. And one of the things I'm not actually bringing up here, but there is a... a um, level of something that is between schizotypal and actual schizophrenia and that is something that individuals with schizophrenia they they might start showing symptoms five to ten years before their full schizophrenia and it's a indication that they're going to develop full schizophrenia and these disorganized speech is one of the biggest things that's an indicator so a person who just um maybe is is giving a presentation and they're just fine and then for part of it they get just get really incoherent or they go off on tangents and and then they maybe get back on track and they don't even realize they're doing something wrong well it, it that's a early indicator that they might develop schizophrenia later as far as treatment schizophrenia is another one where really 
behavioral therapy, any types of cognitive therapy, any types of uh, psychotherapy really have very little effect. They can have some effect on some of the um, negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So they can help individuals with um, those th that lack of interest in things. So CBT can actually help with the negative symptoms. But the positive symptoms and the disorganized symptoms, really there's not much that can be done other than medical treatments or biomedical treatments, drugs. So antipsychotic drugs, um, these are the ones that treat the, the, the serious conditions. So they're, they do, they're directed towards things like dopamine. They reduce levels of dopamine. So these end up reducing the positive symptoms, but they have little effect actually on the negative symptoms. Uh, just a quick tangent here. Uh, it's a really interesting spectrum between Parkinson's and schizophrenia. What I mean by that is, how, do, how are these related? Well, actually, Parkinson's and schizophrenia are both dopamine neurotransmitter disorders. Uh, schizophrenia is too much dopamine. Parkinson's is too little dopamine. And what actually ends up happening is, is individuals with, with schizophrenia who are taking uh, these antipsychotic drugs that reduce dopamine, they start having Parkinson's-like symptoms. And people with Parkinson's, they take drugs to increase dopamine and they'll start having schizophrenia-like symptoms. So they're almost opposite ends of the dopamine spectrum. So just in conclusion, we looked at what is abnormal psychology. We looked at some causes. We looked at some ways that abnormal behavior is obsessed, assessed. We looked at the DSM-5 and looked at some of the changes that have occurred in that. And then we looked at some of the overarching disorders that occur within psychology, anxiety disorders, mood disorders, the conversion and dissociative disorders, the personality disorders, and finally schizophrenia. Thanks. Come on back.